I'm from northeastern Texas, out in the in the piney woods of Rolling Hills and the red clay there. And uh, my relatives migrated here, primary my uncles and uh, my father-in-law and some other relatives, some other people from that community migrated here during the Manhattan Project back in 1943. And I was a young man back home and, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old in that age range. And we would hear when they write back or people in the community talking about Hanford. And so they came out here and worked on the Hanford Project. And then when I got to high school in 1947, I was just 16 years of age, and then I ended up coming to Hanford. My uncles and other relatives was coming through. You know, they had worked out here, and they'd come back home, and, and they could earn much more money, about three times the money here that they could earn back there. And so the word got around. You know, it got around pretty pretty fast, and people were going not only to uh, out here, but they were going to California, Houston, Dallas. They were, they were just beginning to migrate different places because of the work and, and the war and the opportunities there. So when I came out to... Uh, to Washington the first time. It was myself and two first cousins and two other people from the community. There was five of us that came into the Tri-Cities and we lived over in East Pasco in a little tent. It was probably maybe eight, eight or nine feet in diameter and it was only about, oh, maybe three and a half to four feet high. So we didn't, so we actually didn't, didn't sit around in that. That's where we slept. We had to leave East Pasco and walk down to downtown Pasco uh, on 2nd Street to the bus terminal. And then we would catch a bus to Richland. And we worked out at North Richland. It was the city of North Richland out here. But they were working on the barracks and putting in the trailer court and all of that. And uh, so that's what we did. And that's we stayed there for a while. And then we, we commuted out here for about two or three months. And they finally built the barracks. And then we moved out into the barracks and that. In those days, we lived in the barracks for like a dollar and forty cents a week, and that included daily maid service and service and clean linen once a week. Now those days are gone forever. <laughs> See those. Dupont. They had to recruit people, uh, and the War Manpower Board uh, dictated where you could recruit because of wartime, and uh, you just couldn't go over to the coast, say, and and recruit people from the shipyards or the uh, Boeing over there. So a lot of recruitment was done down south because the south wasn't highly industrialized in the 40s. Um, that's why so many southerners live here and they were, given a, they were given a railroad ticket and I have to always kind of laugh because the trains came through the Pasco where the railroad station was located about two o'clock in the morning. And I'm sure if it had come by during the daylight hours, they wouldn't have bothered to get, no, get off the train and <laughs> look at this desert. Because the recruiting posters were really funny. Come to the evergreen state of Washington, sparkling rivers, snow-capped peaks, wonderful fishing and hunting. What do they come to? They come to a desert. The trains were met. They were given a place to sleep the rest of the night. In the morning they went through employment, fun on a bus, and driven the 40, 50 some odd miles from Pasco out to this huge construction camp out here at the old Hanford town site. At the peak of employment there were 55,000 people. It was the fourth largest city in the state of Washington. The uh, people lived in, in barracks, dormitories, the women's barracks was on one side of the camp, surrounded by a barbed wire fence. And because they were recruiting, uh, you know, manpower was so short, they were recruiting girls right out of high school to come here to work as uh, waitresses, uh, secretaries, clerks, anything, you know. So they decided they needed to uh, do something to kind of protect these girls, so they hired a Mrs. Maris. She was dean of women at Oregon State College. Mrs. Maris was in charge of women's affairs, and uh, she organized a lot of things like uh, sororities, scout clubs, all sorts of clubs and that type of organization. She'd organize uh, shopping trips for these women because here they were living out here in the middle of nowhere and the nearest store of any reasonable thing was 80 miles away or things like that. So uh, it made life a little bit more tolerable. 
And they did a lot to try to, to make life more tolerable out here. They built an auditorium. It held 5,000 people. It took seven days to build this auditorium. Big name bands came here and played. Uh, Jimmy Dorsey played here. Uh, Ted Weems played here. Kay Kaiser played here and several more. Um, they also, they built a, a big tavern. At that time, the only thing you could drink in the state of Washington was 3-2 beer, 3.2% alcohol. They uh, opened a brewery over in Walla Walla to make beer for the Hanford Project. Pioneer beer wasn't all that great, but it was beer. Uh, at that time, also in the state of Washington, you had to sit down to, to drink. You couldn't pick your glass up and move it to another table. A waitress or a waiter had to do that. So people would get off work. They would uh, rush to the tavern, claim chairs, and then auction uh, their chair off to the highest bidder. Somebody was always trying to make a buck somehow or other. Uh, many people who came here had never received a paycheck before. Their board and room was taken out of their paycheck. And they left here with thousands of dollars of uncashed paychecks. Everything was paid for, essentially, so it was, a, it was an interesting life.